275 275 how firm a foundation we'll sing all four verses 275 how firm a foundation how firm a foundation ye saints of the lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he hath said to you who for refuge to jesus have fled fear not i am with thee O oh, be not dismayed for I am thy God, and will still give thee aim. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, by grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your blessings upon us and your help. We pray you bless as we meet together tonight and help as we continue through the week later on. Well, thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to hymn number 496, if you would, please. 496, he hideth my soul. 496, all four verses. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Shallows a shadows a dry thirsty land a wonderful savior is jesus my lord a wonderful savior to me he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure i see he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. 
He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When, when clothed in his brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand well, take your bulletins if you would please I'll remind you of a few things one's the ladies bible study coming up june the 6th the other's church cleaning coming up june the 2nd and the yard sale coming up august 4th through the 6th so we hope you can Come and be a part of all those things. We are also thinking about, we've had several things come up in the past few months, and um, I've talked about the devil fighting and things like that. One of those things has been really with the uh, missionaries, and one is we, we had, well, we had one that asked us to stop supporting them for their reasons, and then we had another one that I was hoping, I, I try to give people some leeway, but basically it was just uh, misappropriating funds, and um, so, I mean, I can go into details on that if, if you want the details, but there were a few other things too. So we basically aren't supporting any missionaries right now, though we do have a missions account. And there's some people I have on mind to, um, to pick up. But one thing that uh, Sarah and I were bouncing around, we, we, I believe we talked to Heather about this too, was we're thinking about the college kids and Matthew's in college, Phoebe's going to college, and maybe trying to be a blessing to them each month, as long as they meet a certain criteria, which ultimately summarizes as following Christ. As we always have to leave that open, that, that caveat, as long as you're following the Lord, we'll help you. <laughs> and we want to be a blessing. Uh, we are thinking, giving them while they're at college, as long as they're tithing, as long as they're you know, reading their Bibles, doing what they ought to do, you know, uh, giving them $50 a month and just to let them know that we were thinking about them and we want to help them that would help with books or whatever, whatever they want to use it towards. So um, if you, let me know if you have any thoughts on that or if you have any, any um hesitations on it but we would keep an keep an eye on it we keep an eye on Phoebe and Matthew and Matthew is doing very well this semester so we're thankful for that Phoebe's not even at college yet so we can't say anything about her but we tried to send them a, a card every month to try to talk to them every week every other week at the latest. I mean, you know, Phoebe, we're going to be talking to like every day practically because we're trying to go through the adjustment period. But Matthew, we, we talk to at least at once a week, maybe several times throughout that week, but, and um, just try to be that encouragement. We, we try to do that anyway, honestly. We try to do that anyway, but this is a, just money from the church. So we have it in the missions account. We still have missions money coming in. I do, like I said, I do have a missions uh, 
family. They're already on the field. They're doing a good job. Um, I want to wait a little bit before putting them forth for support, but they're, they're worthy people. They've never been here, but I'd, I'd go through the proper steps to uh, present them to you. Um, and so we'll see what the future holds, but uh, there are people on our hearts and we do want to um, we do want to support missionaries missionaries as we can as they serve around the around the globe and at home. We've got the write-ups from Mr. Ryle and the quotes on the back of the bulletin. And anything else I need to mention, dear? Or, okay. All right. Let me know. Let me know your thoughts about all that, and if you don't. Let me know. We may end up cornering you somewhere and asking you your thoughts. Not literally cornering you, but just asking what you think about it. Are there questions? Heather says no. Kids, you can ask questions too. You're here. No. Okay, if any come up, let us know. Well, I mean, it's the end. It's the end of a. School semester, so we would pick it up in August with trying with helping them out. So, okay. Well, Andrew is going to play for you out of hymn number four sixty two this evening, which is "Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us." Thank you, Andrea. That was 462, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Does anyone have any blessings from this week? Any testimonies? Anything you learned from your Bible reading? Andrea? You've done school for the year. Yeah. So you're done the ninth grade, right? That's good. Jimmy? I've done school for the year. Done, done school for the year. You're done the ninth grade also. Sarah's still going. She has a little different curriculum. But she's, almost done. she's almost done. She only got five more months. No. <laughs> Not quite. Anyone else? Any blessings? Well, school has gone well this week. We're thankful for that. And we had a particular thing we've been, it's not a done deal yet, but we've had on our minds and hearts, Phoebe having a job over in Greenville. And so we got to talk to a manager at Home Depot locally to see what she should do when she gets over there because the Ace Hardwares are much further away than the Home Depot. Home Depot's within just a couple miles. And he said, really, at this point, all she needs to do is walk in, and if she's qualified, they'll probably just hire her on the spot. I said, is it that bad out there for employment? He said, yeah, it's that bad. So that's a blessing for Phoebe. She could basically 
as of right now, she could just show up and say, can I have a job? I'm going to Bob Jones. I've worked at Ace for the past almost two years and done this, 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 and this. And she'll probably have a job. So praise the Lord for that. And if you need a job, <laughs> all you have to do is go to the Home Depot on 153 and walk in the door and they'll hire you on the spot. <laughs> but that's not my words. That's the guy who I talked to. But apparently people just don't want to work today they just don't want to work so praise the lord for people who do want to work and thankful for the opportunities so any other blessings phoebe yeah we got a new watering can for free our old watering can was plastic and falling apart slowly phoebe defected out <laughs> It almost sounds like she she made the defect. She didn't make the defect, but she got a watering can, which was which was nice. So. Anyone else? Look at Mark chapter one, if you would please. We will be in Galatians chapter five, Mark chapter one. And I brought this out last year probably, but you have Jesus beginning his ministry. And it says that in verse 21, that on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. So you imagine the day that Jesus came into, one where the so-called preachers did not preach with authority. They hemmed and hauled and gave what ifs and opinions and feelings. And so Jesus it says he teach, taught as one that had authority. He said, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Bible says, in other words. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, a man with an unclean spirit. So you get the idea in the synagogue, too, which is a type, a picture, not, not a solid type. This isn't a parable or anything like that. But it was a, a congregation, an assembly, similar to what we have as churches today. Imagine that someone that's possessed with the devil could be comfortable in, quote, unquote, church. And in our day... You imagine people would be the same. And when Jesus started to teach with authority and truth, he cried out. He couldn't, he couldn't handle it. And, of course, the Lord cast the devil out of the man. But then you have in verse number 27, the people are amazed and they say to themselves, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. It's sad that in that day, just the clean, pure, straightforward teaching of the word of God was seen as some new doctrine, some new thing, so corrupt and convoluted was the truth in that day. And so it is in our day. People say, I never heard that before. And part of the reason is because people don't teach the Bible properly. They don't teach the truth. You can go into various communities and find so-called Christians and even people that say they love the Bible, but they don't interpret it properly. You got just three sad things there, and you can see how, how it compares to today. Galatians chapter 5, if you care to turn there, unless you have, someone has a praise or blessing. Well, Galatians chapter 5, we're going to move on to the next fruit of the Spirit. And verse 22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We pray you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd fill us with your spirit. 
and use us for your glory. Please help your word to find fertile soil in our hearts. And may we say yes to you, whatever you have to say to us. Well, thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at fruit of the Spirit number three, which is peace. Peace. We did a little bit of an intro to this on Sunday with Psalm 23. And there's great need for peace in our world today. But as with anything, with the fruit of the Spirit, true peace is only found in Christ. It's only found in Christ. When we talk about the word peace, the Greek word for this means specifically peace between individuals or harmony, also called concord. But what we're more familiar with would be the words harmony, peace between individuals. But as with love and joy, this is a peace that we have to work at. We have to work at. There's people in the world that think that they naturally have love, they naturally have the fruit of the Spirit, and that, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. We naturally have the fruit of the flesh. It is God that helps us to bring forth these fruits of the Spirit, and even then we can't be just passive about it, thinking, oh, well, if I just coast along, these will come forth. No, we have to work at it. So as with love and joy, we have to work at it, but cannot compromise scripture upon it. We ought to desire peace, but not sacrifice it on the altar of truth. We ought to want to have peace with others and pursue such with a holy life, but also understand, here's the other side of the coin, that we cannot make people be at harmony with us. We ought to want to have peace with others and pursue such with a holy life. That means a life based upon God's word. But we have to also understand we cannot make people be at harmony with us. You and I, we have to be immovable in one thing. And if we're immovable in this one thing, we will do well. And that is our love and obedience to God's word. Right? Our love and obedience to God's word. So we're going to look at probably about three different things with peace. We're just going to look at the first one this evening. The first one is that this is generally not possible with the world. Now I say generally because it is at times. But Jesus taught us it is generally not possible to have this sort of peace with the world. We should work and hope to live in peace with everyone, including the world. But scripture is clear that the world will not want to do so as they do not believe God's word. That's why the people out there, let's talk about abortion a second, because abortion's a big ticket item right now because of Roe versus Wade uh, either being overturned or about to be overturned apparently. And people all in an uproar, can, can you imagine, can you imagine the people in this world that are in an uproar over saving the lives of babies? But they are. I've heard our president speak about it. I've heard, seen various mayors and congressmen and senators. I don't even follow the news like that, but it shows up and you watch these people say, we want to be able to protect women's rights. They see abortion as a women's rights issue, which is insanity. What about the little innocent baby's rights? What about their rights? They can't protect themselves. What about their rights? They never asked to come into this world. God allowed them to come into this world. They never asked to be killed. What about their rights? So it's convenient for the world to look and say that clump of cells that we call an embryo or a fetus, that clump of cells 
that has a, usually a functioning beating heart, that clump of cells is not life. That's what the world says. But woe be to you if you kick a pregnant dog or cat and they lose their puppies or kittens because you just lost, caused them to lose life. That makes total sense, doesn't it? No, it's insanity. Life is life. We understand that. The Bible teaches that. But we stand upon the foundation of God's word, which is why we're against abortion, murder of any kind. The world stands upon the flavor of the weak. The world stands upon what it feels like standing upon what's convenient for them. Okay? The world does not care about the Bible. We do. So there's a division there, and that causes conflict. So as there is conflict, there can be no peace. Do we want peace? Sure. But we love Christ more. The world's foundations vary with thoughts and opinions. This is why a local church must have Jesus Christ as its foundation, or else it will be varied and confused, right? Right? And we see much of that today. The church in Corinth is a prime example of one of those churches that's varied and confused. We must have unity around Christ or we will not have unity at all. So look, if you will, look, if you will, at Matthew chapter 10. We'll look at the first thing, which is that Christ did not come to earth to bring peace. There, there's many people, they would gasp at this, but... Jesus is very clear on it. Because people want the hippie Jesus, the Jesus that, you know, peace at any cost. No, it's not peace at any cost. It's not peace at any cost. And Jesus is not the hippie Jesus. Jesus is the creator of the universe. He is the word made flesh. He is the one who is the I am, the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning of our faith and the end thereof. The Bible says he did not come to earth to bring peace. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. In other words, he knew exactly what he was doing by coming to earth. He knew exactly what he was doing by preaching what he preached. He knew exactly what he was doing. When he started his ministry, when he went to the cross, when he rose from the dead, when he commissioned his church, he knew exactly what he was doing. And part of that was causing division. Causing division. He says in verse 35, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father. The word variance means to cleave in two. To cleave in two. You have the opposite of that where it says man and woman who are married, they shall be as one flesh. They are one. What man hath joined together, let no man divide asunder. Here, variance. The, cleave in two. Why? Because of Jesus. He says the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You have this spoken of similarly in Luke 12, 51 through 53. And you look at this and say, how terrible. And yes, it is terrible whenever you have to look at your very family member and say, you know, you don't love Christ. We're having problems because you don't love Christ. And you have to deal with that situation so many times, the unsaved, or those backslidden that aren't right with God, they, they cause a division. Because they don't want to follow the Bible, even, even more so with the unsaved. They hate the Bible. They hate God's word. How dare God tell me what to do? I want to do what I want to do. I should be able to do whatever I want to do. That's what the world says. But Jesus says, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. 
And I dare say almost every one of us here tonight probably has some of that in our homes. Whether either with close family or with extended family, we, we know what that's talking about. You say, yeah, there's, there's people in my family that don't like me because I follow Jesus. That's to be expected. It's sad, it breaks your heart, and it ought to because we care. But it's to be expected. This can happen, uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15, in that passage that Paul wrote on marriage and divorce. He writes in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse number 15 about that we are called to peace. He says, if the unbeliever, if you happen to be married to an unbeliever, if the unbeliever can't handle being married to a believer then just let them go. If they determine in their hearts to divorce, just let them go. We can't help what unbelievers do. Very important, very important, because there's still people day, today that are married to unbelievers. Some people, they get married um, before they get saved and you know, marry unbelievers, unbelievers marrying unbelievers. Then one of them gets saved sometimes, both of them do. But yeah, the Bible deals with that situation, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But yeah, it said it tears, tears at our hearts. But we see the truth of it here. Christ didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. He came to set a man at variance with his family. And secondly, under that, he expects his disciples, he expects us to hold fast to him. Not to say, oh, mom and dad's mad. Oh, brother, sister's mad. Oh, this person's mad. I'm going to do what this person wants me to do because they're my family. No, no, we, we need to love Jesus more and do what God wants us to do. Because he died for us. He saved us. And that's what he says here in verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And have we not studied in Luke where he says similar things? He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. In Luke he says, he that hateth not his father or mother, you know, and, his own, and goes on in his own life also cannot be my disciple. He's not talking about hating people there, of course. He's talking about priorities. Where do you put Jesus compared to person X, Y, Z? Is Jesus your top priority? Is Jesus above all? Is Jesus preeminent? Or is someone or something else? It must be Christ because he is worth it. It says, he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I could give you examples just from growing up of both of these, but in particular, of parents that idolize their children. Parents that idolize their children. And because they idolize their children, they forsake Christ. They compromise Scripture. What they used to do in following Christ, they don't do anymore. Jesus says we have to keep him as a priority. We have to love him above all. He says in verse 39, uh, 38, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. We have to understand the Christian walk is laying down our lives and taking up a cross and following Jesus doing whatever he bids us to do, and he'll never have us do anything and conflict with his word. Doing whatever he bids us to do for his glory. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And that's what it's talking about, just dying to self. At, at the least, dying to self. At the most, actually giving up our lives for Christ, if that's required of us. But at least dying to self and saying, Jesus, 
you have the preeminence in my life. Even if it causes a tear in my family or with my friends or with whatever, I need to follow you because you, you are my Savior. You are my Lord and Master. He's worth it. If we say we are Christ's disciples, we must understand the cost of being such. And Luke chapter, uh, the passage in Luke talks about discipleship, covers that too. We will lose certain things and people from our lives. It will happen. But, on the other hand, we will gain Christ. We will lose our ambitions, but we'll gain God's blessing. There is nothing better than making Christ to be preeminent. There is nothing better than following Christ with our lives. It's not easy. It's not easy. We're told right here that it's not. It's full of, full of many sorrows at times. It is full of many joys too. Christ did not come to earth to bring peace. And number two, number two, Christ did not tell us to have peace at any cost with the world. Now, he also didn't say, go and attack the world, go and fight with the world. <laughs> you know, there's plenty of people that think he is somewhere lost in the pages of Scripture. He did say to do that. No, Jesus never says to do that. But he, he did not tell us to have peace at any cost with the world. Two godly men, one you're familiar with, J.C. Ryle said, never let us be guilty of sacrificing any portion of truth on the altar of peace. And Matthew Henry, the commentator, said similarly, peace is such a precious jewel that I would give anything for it but truth. I would give anything for it but truth. We all don't want peace. And when we can't have it, when we know that in order to have it, we have to compromise Scripture, it ought to hurt us. It ought to hurt us. But we still can't compromise Scripture. Two things under this. One, we're to work to live as peaceably as possible with everyone. As peaceably as possible with everyone. Meaning our attitude should be godly. Our actions should be godly, right? We ought to work to live as peaceably as possible with everyone. Romans 12, verse number 14 the Bible says, bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. And weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Meaning, don't, don't pursue after riches. Yet again. Mind not high things. Don't go and think that the, the rich people, the powerful people, the highfalutin people are anything. He says, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, and I would say as an aside, sometimes it is not possible. But Paul says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, as much as you can, working hard to pursue after this, right? Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. You know, someone comes across your way and they say, oh, I just... I, could, could you have some, you know, if, it, if they're your enemy and they're coming to you for some food, they're really hungry. Because, <laughs> you know, people that don't like you aren't going to come talk to you. If they ask food, they're really hungry. The Bible says, 
Feed them. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's not literally, that's figuratively. In other words, he's treated you poorly. He's backstabbed you to the community. And all you can do is be kind to him. <laughs> People know. People see that, not just the two of you, but others see that. Paul says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be not overcome of evil. You say, how can someone get overcome of evil? It's, as I've mentioned in previous weeks, it, the devil just comes at you and comes at you and comes at you and comes at you. And you know it's not the devil physically that does that. It's people, right? It's people. But you get weary in well-doing. We do get hurt. And there is the temptation, there is the chance for people to be overcome as a tide would wash over someone, right? Think of an avalanche that someone gets caught up in. People get overcome by. There's people that happens to. They never recover from it for one reason or another. And the Bible says, be not overcome of evil. You say, how can I avoid that? Just have that thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. Be not overcome of evil. Even if you get knocked down for a little bit, and you become as Elijah, you become as David, and your heart is just broken, you don't think you can continue on, but you keep following Christ, you'll get back up because God will make sure of it. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. So three things there. One, we have to be forgiving instead of retaliating and seeking revenge. Very clear in there. We've talked about that. Work to live as peaceably as possible with everyone. Forgiving. If the world comes against us, people do things, we, be, we forgive Forgive doesn't mean make them your best buddies. It doesn't mean stay around them. It simply means don't seek revenge against them. Whatever you think might be just to recompense your hurt, don't do it. Don't go after it. It's not worth it because vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. That's where faith comes in. Faith. You know, looking unto Jesus, trusting in his word. Faith, a hope in the invisible God. Faith. God will take care of it. If there's something to be taken care of, God will take care of it. Be sure that he sees. There's times that Phoebe's work. Daddy wants to go and deal with the jerky teenage boys. With Phoebe and with Sarah and with Heather. Yes, I feel, I feel that way with all three of them. But it's Phoebe that's had the dealings and... It's not worth it. Sometimes my wife would let me go. It's, it's, it's not worth it. It's not that I'm any great thing. It's just an example. It's not worth it. We either believe that God will take care of it or we don't. Forgive instead of retaliating and seeking revenge. Secondly, being of the same mind with the brethren. Verse 16, be of the same mind, one toward it. How, how do we find peace in the church? Because this is Paul writing to the believers, right? Specifically here in this verse, be of the same mind, one to another. Mind not high things, but consent to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. How do we have the same mind? Well, we, we work to be humble. We work to bear the fruit of the Spirit. All of us have that thriving relationship with Christ. And we'll do these things. We'll be united around Scripture. Not our, not our politics, not our opinions, not our thoughts and feelings, but Scripture. Scripture. 
that's the, remember, the, the one immovable foundation because we can all have our thoughts and feelings and build upon those thoughts, feelings, and various other things. It must be God's word. If we say, well, I, I don't like that, we have to be willing on the other side of the coin to say, but it is the Bible, so because it is the Bible, it is well. It's faith. That's how we're of the same mind with the brethren. And then third, we have to look, be kind instead of hateful. Be kind instead of hateful. And the verses talk about that. The enemy hunger feed him, right? If you thirst, give him drink. Bless them which persecute you. Bless them and curse not. Be kind. Matthew chapter 5. Love your enemies. Forgive them that curse you. Bless them that curse you. Forgive them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Be kind. Be kind. And God helps us to be so. That's how we work to be peaceable with people. We were talking on Sunday with Wayne and Nancy about COVID and whatnot. And Sarah and I said, you know, in this was even way before COVID started years ago. We said we learned in having to, as a pastor, I've learned have, you have to deal with the government. You have property taxes. You have very many things that can come up because the church in many aspects is seen as a business, as a nonprofit organization by the government. And you have to do certain legal things at times. You have to deal with the government. And... I, we've just found if you simply try to work with the government, they're pretty nice people. <laughs> and, oh, Sarah and I have heard horror stories over the years, this, that, and the other. If you're not belligerent, if you treat people like they're human beings they generally will work with you. But we have factions and, and it's of the flesh that just believe, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, I'm a Baptist, so you need to bend over backwards for me. I deserve, that's called entitlement, and we don't deserve that. We don't deserve that. Jesus says, work to live as peaceably as possible with everyone. He says, also, we have to learn to guard our associations. And this is where we'll finish up this evening. Learn to guard our associations. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 22 the Bible says, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, and peace. Well, we know what all four of those are. Righteousness is a life lived in accordance with God's word. Faith is looking unto Jesus, trusting in his word. Charity is godly love. Peace is harmony, you know, as we just have been looking at. It says, flee, but follow these things with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So who are we supposed to follow righteousness, faith, charity, and peace with? Well, with other people that also want the same. In other words, we're to be around those that love Christ. Who are to be your friends and mine, those that love Jesus? Who are, to be, who are we to be around and allow to influence us, those that love Jesus, and prove so? And so he says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. There's some people out there, they don't care what the Bible says. They just want to challenge your faith, not with the hope of learning anything, but with the hope of making, excuse me, making you doubt And the Bible says, avoid those. Avoid those. 
over time as you deal with people, you can find which is which. People that love God's word will talk about it, will talk about it civilly, right? You can have a conversation, not a debate and an argument. It's rare, it's rare, but they do exist. And then there's others, all they want you to do is come to their side. They don't care what you think. They don't care what the Bible even says. They just want you on their side. And there's plenty of people like that. They're the people we're to avoid because it just genders. It says strife. Strife. And it says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. We find people like that. We're not to fight with them. That's where uh, this, at least one of the places where I have learned that we're not to debate with people. There's, you, you had over the years some highfalutin Christian so-called Bill Nye the science guy. Bill Nye is an evolutionist. I think he, he debated with Ken Ham, the creation scientist. And you know all that did? It did nothing. Because when two people debate, the one side's not trying to learn what the other side believes and then comes to the point of, oh, well, you're right. I'm wrong. No, that's, that's I, I've never seen that happen in a debate. A debate is, at best, formal arguing. And that doesn't help anyone. People either want to learn the truth or they don't. And if they don't want to know the truth, we have to learn to identify that, stop arguing with them, and walk away. Say, I'm not going to argue with you. Figuratively kick the dust off your feet if you have to, and move on. Because no one ever got saved from a debate, from an argument about Jesus. I think you'll agree, you and I, we came to Christ because we fled to him. We needed him. We needed forgiveness of sins. It's not because we heard a debate and said, you know, that, that Ken Ham, and Ken Ham has some very positive things about him and some very negative things. I've learned a great deal from Ken Ham over the years. But regardless, that Ken Ham, you know, I was an evolutionist, but now, now I see where creationism is, is the way I need to go doesn't happen if it does that's the exception not the rule the servant of the lord must not strive you know who does strive it's the world and the world loves to fight there's people that feed off of it and they will try to get you into it if for nothing else so that they can say oh well they're no different than me It says, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, such humility, instructing those that oppose themselves. If per God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and I will add to that, you cannot teach someone if they will not be taught. Right? We're not supposed to fight. So if all someone wants to do is debate and fight, that you can't teach. But if someone will listen to you, listen, really listen, <laughs> let you get your words in instead of trying to argue with you, maybe, maybe they will be taught. And there are some people out there like that. We, we again, we sat we hadn't seen Wayne and Nancy for about two years. They're, we know them from Maryland. And, and there were some things that they mentioned that, that 
we got to have discussions on and talk about and, and what have you. And it, it was great. There was no arguing. There was no debating. Because they love the word of God, they're seekers of truth, just like Sarah and I try to be. And, and it was great. It was great. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So three things under this. We have to learn to guard our associations. One, uniting with those that love God's word. Two, fleeing from those that do not love God's word. And three, attempting to help those that oppose themselves. Only take number three so far. If people don't want to hear it, you can't make them want to hear it. All you and I can do is sow seed. Just like I'm attempting to do tonight. Just sow seed and pray, God, work in hearts. I came across the passage this week in Mark as I was reading through where Jesus told the soon-to-be apostles, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. But you know, in our day, at least in the circles that I used to walk in, that has been made and convoluted to become something that never was meant to be. All we're supposed to do as fishers of men is cast the net with the right bait. We don't even draw the net in. The Holy Spirit draws people. The bait's just the gospel, if you want to call it bait, if you're using a fishing illustration. It's just the gospel. It's not candy. It's not promotions. It's not this or the other. Oh, you, it's not heaven. <laughs> it's the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins. The gospel message. We can't cheapen it. We can't change it and make it into a false gospel. You know, the, the saved Jews did that, the churches in Galatia. Well, you got you to gotta be circumcised to be saved. You got to follow the law to be saved. And Paul said, no, you just made it into a false gospel, guys, which is not the true gospel. We have that in our day. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. The world does not know God's peace. Romans 3.17 says so. Thus, Christ knows that it will generally not be able to live with his people that stand upon his word. Nevertheless, it falls to believers to try to live as peaceably as possible with the world without compromising his word. Who are to be the aggressors? The world or us? Never us. It will always be the world, or it must always be the world according to Christ, if we're to be as Christ. We're the ones to promote peace, to try to live as peaceably as possible. But the world that cannot handle the word of God, the world that despises sound truth, like babies that are in the womb are babies, and deserve to live and not die. The world that despises sound truth, let them be the aggressors if they're going to be. And if they're going to be, that's up to them. God will take care of us. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that you bless it, that you'd help us to learn these things and to apply them to our lives. We'll thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any prayer requests tonight? Pray for Phoebe as she's head to college in a few months. Matthew, he's going through finals this week and he's coming home very soon. Susan's traveling, it's my understanding. So pray for her as she visits family. 
Brother Carol, I have not heard how his surgery went. So hopefully, just keep praying for him if you would. Hopefully all is well there. Any other prayer requests? Okay. All right. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time where we can pray, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Thank you for loving us, and we just pray that you would help us as we go through the rest of the week. Help us to make you preeminent in our life. Help us to work to live peaceably with folks and please you in that matter. Lord, we just pray that you be with Phoebe. She's headed to Bob Jones here in August, that all would continue to fall into place. We thank you for the good news this week, and we just pray you continue to work. We see you constantly opening doors and shutting others, and we just thank you. We pray you'd help Matthew as he's doing finals this week and headed back home. We pray you keep him safe and pray that his uh, time off for the summer would be profitable. Pray you'd help Susan. She travels and sees family. We pray you keep her safe and pray that all would go well there. Pray for Brother Carol with his surgery. We hope it went well. We pray that you'd help him to heal and thank you for Thank you for godly, godly individuals. Thank you Wayne and Nancy could come this week. That was a blessing to us. It's always good to see them, and we just pray you'd help them to be safe as they travel. Lord, we pray that you would help us again as we go through the rest of the week. May we please you. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll turn to 405, if you would, please. 405, my faith has found a resting place. We'll stand together and then we'll be dismissed. 405, my faith has found a resting place. Let's stand together. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. God bless you for being here this evening. It was good to see each and every one of you. We hope to see you Sunday at 10 and 11 for service, if not before. If you do need anything, please let us know. We'll be praying for you. God bless you.